said that prayer is the soul's sincere desire unuttered or expressed the motion of a hidden fire that trembles within the breast gracious God we come this morning first and foremost to worship and praise your holy and righteous name oh God how we adore you how we love you how we applaud and appreciate you we thank you for loving us with an unconditional love it was that love that woke us up this morning and started us on our way it was that love that kept us safe from dangers seen and unseen and brought us safely to this very point in time. And we want to pause and give you praise and say thank you. Thank you for being better to us than we deserve. Thank you for being better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. Our strong God, we thank you for the new mercies that greeted us when our eyes made, made the connection to the virgin light of a brand new day. We thank you. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins and sinfulness. Lord, we confess that we haven't done everything that you expect of us. And we've done some things that you forbid us to do and so we humbly confess our sins and ask for your forgiveness and we're thankful that your word encourages us and ensures us that if we confess our sins that you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so our strong God, we, we pray that your will will be done in the earth, in our lives, as it is in heaven. Have your way. I ask that you would bless, bless us all individually and collectively with the blessings that we stand in the need of. Lord, I pray for families who are dealing with bereavement, who are hurting because their loved one is gone I pray that they will find your word to be true when you promised blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted I pray that they will find your word to be true when you said you never leave us nor forsake us 
that even in the midst of their pain, that they can experience your presence. And if they can experience your presence, then I know that they'll experience your power, your peace, your preservation, your protection, your provision. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Have your way in this worship experience. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God praise. Come on, praise team. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on and put your hands together. Come on and bless the Lord with me. Hallelujah. Let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah.
Come on right here, man. Open your mouths and begin to worship our God. In this season, in this time of where we are with the pandemic and everything, the only person that we can trust is God. To see us through it. Everything, everything that's going on. So come on right here and just lift your hands and open your mouths right here and worship him. Hallelujah. Oh, trust in him. Him only. Said you can. As long as I live right, yeah, I'll hasten, I hasten to his throne. Said you gotta trust in him, trust in him. Said him only, him only. Say you can, you can. Trust in him, trust in him, said him only, him only, said you can, you can, depend on him, depend you ought to try him, you ought to 
said, put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. Say you want to try him. You want to try him. Said you want to try him. You want to try him. Said you want to try him. You want to try him. Trust in him. Put your trust in him. Say, put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. Singing again, say, put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. Say, put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. Come on and put your hands together and bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Have you tried him this morning? Have you trusted him? Oh, if you trusted him and tried him, then you know he can be trusted. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, didn't, didn't they bless us? And had God blessed you, have you tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord? The psalmist declared, I've been young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. Why? Because you can trust him. I promise you, if you're trying, you won't regret it. If you're trying, every day will be sweeter than the day before. Yeah, life, it still might be a bumpy road, but I promise you, if you're trying, it'll be a joy ride. Oh, I tried him for myself. I didn't go with, on what mama said or what daddy said alone. But I had to try him for myself. And I can testify. Oh, he has done exceedingly, abundantly above anything that I could ask or think. Come on and give God praise. Give God praise for the praise team the band, the musicians. Now give God praise for you and your life. If God has been good to you. If you've seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, you ought to be able to give our God praise this morning. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, would you go with us to the book of Second Kings? Second Kings, and we're going to go to chapter 4 of Second Kings, and I'm going to read a few verses in your hearing, beginning at verse number 1. Second Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1. Now the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She answered, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. He said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not just a few. And then go in and shut the door behind you and your children. And, when, and, and, and start pouring into all the vessels. When each is full, set it aside. So she 
left him and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her, and she kept pouring. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, there are no more. My brothers and sisters, for the next few moments that I was to share, I simply want to talk to you from this thought, this theme. Down, but not out. Down, but not out. It was November 1989, just before Thanksgiving. My dad and my stepmom had been to the movies. And while at the movies, my dad began to feel sick. He said his throat began to hurt and his body began to ache, leading him to believe that he was coming down with a severe cold or the flu. So on their way home from the movies, they stopped by the pharmacy, got some cold and flu medicine, some juice and some other supplies and went on home. And my dad got home, he took the medicine, drank some of the juice and went to bed. But as the night progressed, so did my dad's sickness because he began to feel worse and worse. And the next morning, his body ached all over. His throat was sore. He felt awful. And on top of that, his throat had swollen so much so that it looked like he swallowed a grapefruit whole. And once they saw the swelling in his neck and the pain that he was experiencing, they rushed my dad to the emergency room. The doctors in the emergency room were scratching their head, running test after test. They thought he might have had strep throat, and they ruled out strep. And they kept running tests, and my dad kept feeling worse. And finally, they said that my dad had a staph infection. They didn't know how to treat it or if they were going to be able to treat it. And so once they found the diagnosis, the prognosis wasn't good. They told my stepmother that he'd be lucky to make it through the night. My brothers and sisters, my father was down and on his way out, according to the doctors. But my father knew he was down, but he still had breath in his body and the ability to call on the Lord. And that's what he did. He didn't turn to the wall like Hezekiah did, but he got down on the floor, on the side of that hospital bed, and he began to call on the Lord. And my brothers and sisters, my father got through praying. And he said that as he prayed, he felt the peace of God overpower him. And his fear left, and he was able to get up and get in the bed. And get some rest. And the next morning when the doctors came in expecting my father to be worse, instead they found him better. And my brothers and sisters, God gave my father a 24-hour turnaround. My father was down, but he was not out. And just like God sent Hezekiah to tell him that he would live, God sent me to tell you that though you may be down, you're not out. That everything is going to be all right. People may have given up on you, but don't you give up on God. The world and the devil, like my father's doctors, may be telling you that you won't make it, that, that, that you're down and you feel like you can't get up. But I want to encourage you this morning because God sent me to tell you that it's not over. That the victory is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. You might be down, but you ain't out. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this woman in our text was down. Life was doing its best to make sure that she would stay down. And sisters and brothers, I think I ought to tell you that this woman was down and on her way out. The record is that she's a widow. Her husband, who was a part of the company of the prophets, had died. And not only, my brothers and sisters, did she lose her companionship, but she lost all the other benefits that come along with marriage. 
and now she's helpless to provide for herself. Her income died with her husband. Her husband uh, didn't just die penniless, but he died in debt. There was no life insurance policy for her to cash in and live off and pay off her husband's debts and live on. And her husband's creditors on top of that were coming to take her two sons that she had left as slaves to work off her husband's debt. And not only has she lost her husband, but now she's facing the possibility of losing her son. This woman was down. Her husband is dead. She has no life insurance, no job. And the sons who could have worked and taken care of her were on their way to being taken into slavery. Mount Moriah, this woman was down. The creditors could have cared less about this woman. They, they, they didn't even show any mercy. The Bible says that uh, we ought to be uh, especially careful to care for the widows and the orphans. And here this widow woman is with with two sons and the creditors could care less about her being a widow and not having any source of income because they are ready to take not one of her sons but both of her sons into slavery leaving her penniless and without hope of sustenance she didn't know how she was going to make it and I think I ought to tell you this morning that the world hadn't changed much from the time of the text because we can tell that uh, creditors and, 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 and employers and, 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 and uh, renters uh, and, and, and leasing agents could care less about the plight of this pandemic and how some people who want to work can't work. And they are still ready to uh, repossess cars. They are still ready to evict folk from homes and, and, and apartments. And my brothers and sisters, the world could care less about you and what you're going through. We live in this thing that they call the survival of the fittest. It's a dog-eat-dog dog world out there. That's the world's mentality. The world says, what's in it for me? If I can't benefit from your situation, then I won't uh, try to help uh, uh, eliminate the pain that you're going through. That's the way the world is. But God is not like that. God says that we can cast our cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for us. The world may not care, but God cares. And we need to stop looking for the world to help us and trust and know that if we turn it over to the Lord that he can and he will fix it. Somebody knows that God can and God will fix it because he's fixed it for you. And my brothers and sisters, that's what this woman did. She turned it over to the Lord. The record is that a certain woman, this certain woman cried unto Elisha for help. We don't get this woman's name. She wasn't on the who's, who's list of Israel. She wasn't voted most popular. And when she went into town, folk probably didn't know who she was. But my brothers and sisters, I think I ought to tell you that even though she may have been unknown to the world, she wasn't unknown to God. And the same is true for each of us. We may, meet, we may not be known all over the world, like Michael Jackson or, or Coca-Cola, but we are known by God. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather be known by an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, merciful, just God than by a powerless, power-hungry, limited knowledge, uh, unloving, unmerciful, uncaring, unjust world. Sometimes I grew up in the church and sometimes church folk get upset when the pastor, some other church leader, doesn't know their name. And it's nothing wrong with wanting your pastor to know your name. But I, I think I ought to tell you that it's more important that God knows your name. And I'm glad to report this morning that God does know your name. And since God knows your name, we ought to stop clamoring for folk who could care less about us and get to know the one who knows you better than you know yourself. And yet he still loves you. He still wants to hear from you daily 
He still wants to spend time with you. He knows us uh, better than we know ourselves, and yet he still wants to bless us. And I'm glad that he knows my name. The president may not know my name, but Providence does. Your name may not be on their list, but if you're saved, it's on his list because it's written in the Lamb's book of life. And since he knows our name, I need us to know that he cares about us more than we could ever imagine. He's concerned about every aspect of our lives. God is concerned about everything that concerns us, even the small things. I remember when Summer was a little girl. And the first time she watched E.T. And when it was going off, she began to cry. And I didn't understand it. And, and, and why, why are you crying, baby? Because the movie is going off. I, I said, oh, okay. The next time she watched E.T., and she began to cry as the movie credits began to roll. And I asked her again, Summer, why are you crying? It's got a happy ending. And she was upset and crying because it was going off. Never mind the fact that you could start the DVD over again. Summer, in her little mind, the movie was going off and that bothered her enough to make her cry. And even though I thought it was silly, I didn't let my child feel that I thought it was silly. I took time to investigate, to find out the source of her pain. And I think I need to tell you that that's how God does us. Our small worries mean everything to him because we mean everything to him. We may not mean much to the world, but we mean the world to God. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this woman cries to Elisha because she has a problem and she's no different than all of us if we're honest about it all of us have problems we may not all have the same problem but we all have problems just the same the difference is not just in the problems but also in how we handle our problems some people try to ignore problems and are thinking that if they ignore the problem that the problem will somehow uh, disappear by osmosis and some people my brothers and sisters take drugs hoping that they can escape the pain of their reality even if only for a moment but that's only making the situation worse instead of better others try to work it out themselves or pay someone else to work it out but that doesn't work because we don't have all the answers. We make mistakes. We're imperfect. We don't have enough. Our resources are limited. The best doctors lose patients. The best lawyers lose cases. But I think I ought to tell you that God is a doctor that's never lost a patient and a lawyer who's never lost a case. And when we take our problems to God, we ain't just trusting anybody. We are trusting in the God who spoke the very world into existence. Everything that ever will, ever was or will be, God created. And so if your life is a wreck, give him a call. One call, that's all. I ain't talking about Ken Nugent, but I'm talking about the king of kings. And my brothers and sisters, whatever your problem is, take it to the Lord. That's what this widow woman does in the text she takes her problem to God through the prophet Elisha the widow comes to Elisha and tells him her dilemma and Elijah doesn't turn her away Elijah doesn't say what does that have to do with me oh brothers and sisters he he wanted to know what he could do to help this woman and I wish we had more folk like Elijah, who were eager to help. It's, it's a sad day when folk don't want to help folk in need. It, it, it's a sad day when people refuse to help somebody who needs help. We have communities that need our help, but we get two nickels to rub together. 
And then we leave the community that birthed us and raised us trying to find a deluxe apartment in the sky and don't realize or don't care that the community, the community that you're so desperate to leave is desperate need of your help. Somebody helped you, so you ought to want to help somebody else. You ain't where you are all by yourself, and I promise you if you think that you are where you are because you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. Then I got a question for you. Who gave you the boots? Uh, who gave you uh, the activity of your limbs so you could pull the bootstraps up? All I'm trying to tell you is if you think you made it where you are by yourself, you need to think again. And my brothers and sisters, you can't be connected to God and you won't help people who need help. You can't be connected to God and you're trying to deny people the right to elect their representatives by creating laws that will allow politicians uh, and representatives, in the words of Freddie Haynes, to elect their voters. Stop talking about you're a Christian and that's why you don't want to wear a mask and you don't want your children to wear a mask during a pandemic. If you were connected to God, you know that God wants his children to think of others more highly than they think of themselves. He wants us to put the needs of others before our own need. And so the school is saying wear a mask to protect your children from a pandemic, to protect you from bringing a pandemic to the house, and you want to fight to wear a mask to spread the pandemic. But you claim that God is on your side. Uh, if you were connected to God, you stop spewing lies and hate just because you disagree with somebody. And since Elijah was connected to God, he was eager to help this woman. Elijah doesn't wait for an answer to his question, what can I do for you? But instead, he asked the widow another question, what do you have in your house? And the woman said she didn't have anything in the house except a jar of oil. And it's not, my brothers and sisters, that God needed anything to work the miracle for this woman. That's not why Elijah asked her that question. But I believe he asked her that question to show us that the Lord takes what he's given us, uh, like our talents, gifts, physical abilities, financial provisions, our network, to, 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 to multiply them if we have faith to trust him to take what we have and trust him with it. And she was so destitute that the only thing she had was a little jar of oil. And my brothers and sisters, the widow in Zarephath, who Elijah, his mentor, went to, she had a, a cruise of oil and a little flour. When Jesus fed the 5,000 and the 4,000 in Bethsaida, the disciples had two fish and five loaves of bread. But all this widow woman had was a little oil. And there may be somebody listening to me this morning who like this woman. You don't have much. You don't have much patience, much love, much <clears throat> grace, much health, much time, much peace, much talent, much food, much clothes, much money. You don't have much of anything. But I can along with others testify that God can take your little <clears throat> and multiply it and meet your need. So Elijah asked her to go and borrow empty vessels from her neighbors. The vessels needed to be empty for a few reasons. For one, full vessels would have been too heavy to carry. And they would have been burdensome, and God is not in the business of burden, burdening his people. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me because my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. But another reason, my brothers and sisters, that the vessels needed to be empty because if the vessels were full, that she would have been in more debt.
that would have meant that she was borrowing oil from her neighbors. She would have been in more debt. And one of the worst things that we can do when we're in financial straits is to borrow and get into more debt. We only dig ourselves into a deeper hole when we do that. And my brothers and sisters, the main reason that the vessels needed to be empty was so God could fill them. God won't fill a vessel that's already full. That's why the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day couldn't receive the word of God because they were full of their own righteousness, pride, and traditions. And there was no room for God. And they didn't make room uh, like Jonathan McReynolds. And my brothers and sisters, don't you remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector who prayed? The Pharisee uh, looked up to heaven and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I, I thank you that I'm a better class of people. I, I, I thank you that I have privilege. I, I thank you that I uh, don't have to worry about anybody stopping and harassing me about do I belong here. I, I thank you that I ain't like him. But my brothers and sisters, don't you remember the tax collector, the publican, the Bible says he wouldn't even look up towards heaven. And he beat on his chest and said, Lord, have mercy on a sinner like me. And my brothers and sisters, Jesus says that the only one who went home justified was the tax collector. The one who was full of himself got none of God because the one who came empty handed got all of God. And if you want all of God, if you want God to fill you with his Holy Spirit and all of his goodness, then you need to do like my granddaddy used to say, come before him as an empty pitcher before a full fountain. So Elijah tells her to go and borrow these empty vessels and don't ask just for a few. In other words, Elijah was saying, bring as many as you have faith for God to fill. And through the prophet Elijah, God was telling her, and us, believe me for your total need. All of us this morning need to believe God to meet our total need. And the wonderful thing about God is that he said he would meet and supply all of our needs. I think I ought to tell you that we insult God when we uh, skip on and, and doubt his ability and willingness, willingness to bless us to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we can ask or think. And so come to God knowing that he can and he will meet your needs. I don't care how big or small you can trust him with it. I don't care what others say, you can trust God. If you trust God, David says that those who hope or trust in God will never be put to shame. And so Elijah tells the widow that once the vessels, once she has the vessels to go inside and shut the door and fill them until they're full. And the record is that the woman did just as Elijah told her. She and her sons went in the house and shut the door. And she told her sons to bring her a vessel. And she took her jar with this little bit of oil and began to pour until the first vessel was full. And then she said, bring me another. And she kept pouring until that one was full. And she said, bring me another. And she kept pouring until that was full. And she kept pouring until there were no more empty vessels. And I think I ought to tell you that once all the vessels were full, she didn't go out and misuse what God had done for her. And she wanted to be a good steward over the blessings that God had given her. And so she went to Elisha to find out what she ought to do next. She wanted God's guidance, and that's how you and I ought to be. We ought to seek God's guidance in every aspect of our lives. But my brothers and sisters, as I prepare to take my seat, I think I ought to tell you 
that Elijah told her to sell the oil and pay off her debts. And she and her sons could live on the rest. And not only could the woman live on the rest, but also her sons could too. And this tells me that when we trust and obey the Lord, not only are we blessed, but so are others who are in our lives. We are blessed to be a blessing. And this woman was down and on her way out, but she cried unto the Lord. And like my father and countless others, she got a 24-hour turn around. And oh, my brothers and sisters, I don't care what your situation is this morning. If you turn it over to God, he will fix it for you. You may be saying, preacher, you don't know my situation. My situation is worse than this widow's or anybody else's that's ever lived. No one has ever been down like me before. I think I ought to tell you, look at Jesus. He left glory to come down to earth. He lived a sinless life, but religious leaders would down him every chance they got. When they finally arrested him, they beat him down. They hung him on a cross and drove spikes down in his wrist and his ankles. Look with me, if you will, at the Lord dying on the cross for our sins. He's crying out to his father from whom he was separated while on the cross. God turned away from Jesus momentarily while he bore the sins of the world because God doesn't like to look at sin. My brothers and sisters, Jesus was shown up down when God turns away from you, you're showing up down. And I tell you, he was down. He was down like no one had ever been down before. My brothers and sisters, once he died, they took him down off the cross, laid him down in a borrowed tomb. He was down in the grave all night Friday night and all night Saturday night and my brothers and sisters but early on Sunday morning the Bible says it was early before the break of day Jesus got up with all power in his hands now if God can raise Jesus from the dead surely he can lift from your down position. Whatever's got you down, if you got breath in your body, I need you to know that you ain't out. Call on him. Call on him. And I promise you, he'll come see about you. I don't care how low you think you are. If you call on the Lord, he'll lift you up. You might be in a down state of mind, but Jesus can lift you up. You might be at death's door, but Jesus can lift you up. All your money may be gone, but Jesus can lift you up. The bill collectors may be ringing your phone, but Jesus can lift you up. You ain't got no job, don't know how you're going to make it. But I promise you, even though you're down, you ain't out. Because Jesus can lift you up. Call on him. 
I promise you, he'll come see about you. And my brothers and sisters, he ain't just all time, but he's in time. I promise you, when he shows up, it'll be in time. Can you give God praise right where you are? Say thank you, thank you, thank you. Give God praise. Woo! He'll pick you up. He'll turn you around. He'll place your feet on solid ground. Give God praise right where you are. Because even though you're down, I promise you, you ain't out. Hallelujah. Give God praise. We're getting ready to go into communion. Get your elements ready. But you might be down. But just remember, you ain't out. If God be for you, who can be against you? God bless you. I love you. The word of God has gone forth mightily. And God's word declares that his word shall not return unto him void, but it shall accomplish that which he purposed. And we know that if you don't have a relationship with God the Father, through God the Son, that the purpose of that word was to invite you to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's as simple as A, B, C. A, admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Acknowledge that Christ is the Son of the living God. Believe that he died on your behalf and that God raised him from the dead. And confess that belief with your mouth. The Bible declares that you will be saved, that you are saved. And if you made that declaration and that decree, would you come in, in the chat and let us know? Would you email us or call us so that we can celebrate with you in your decision to take God at his word? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you for the blessings of life and the blessings of this day. We thank you for this worship experience. We thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. We thank you, O oh God, for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the privilege to worship you through giving. We ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver, that both will be used for the furtherance and upbuilding of your kingdom. And we pray that no one who gave will suffer because of that gift, but we'll all find your word to be true when you promise to meet and supply every need according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. When you said that if we bring the tithes into the storehouse, that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we would not have room enough to receive. When you said, if we give, it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into our bosom. And our strong God, we, we thank you for, again, how you moved mightily on our hearts. We ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us. Pray, O oh God, that you would continue to bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Pray that you would lift up your countenance upon us and grant us your peace. A peace that the world did not give and therefore the world cannot take away. A peace that surpasses all understanding and a peace that will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Now may trouble neglect us. May our neighbors respect us. May angels protect us, and when you call, may heaven accept us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a wonderful week until we meet again.